Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about finding relief from depression. I'm delighted to welcome special guest, Zach Rutledge. Zach has spent almost 20 years researching depression and the methods to help anyone suffering. He's written a book called The Official Depression Relief Playbook, Real Life Strategies from a Guy Who Has Lived It, which is available on Amazon. Welcome, Zach. I'm so glad you could join with me today. Oh, thank you so much. It's a real honor. Oh, I am so excited. I am super, super excited to be talking about this one because you are a guy who has lived it and you are someone who has researched and then put a book together with the intent to be able to help other people who are going through this. And I am a person who has lived it and who has healed and who has written books and also trying to help people to heal. So as we talk today, I'm super excited to see kind of that Venn diagram of where we overlap and things that are different. Because when you teach true principles, for sure, there's going to be overlap. But also our experiences can be very different and there's more than one right way to do things, which is super exciting. Because when you're in that process of healing and someone says, oh, do this, it worked really well. And you say, but I hate it. And it's like, it's okay, because you can do A, B, C, and D. So super excited. Is it okay if we start with your story? Yeah, that's great. But real quick, I would like to address that. I think you hit it on the head there, because I say in the book, there is no silver bullet. Um, and so, so, and there is no silver, silver bullet for everyone. But also, like you said, you can do A, B, C, and D. And I feel like that's where some of the magic is. It's kind of that... Um, I don't know what the saying is, two plus two equals five type of deal. So when you combine these things, it's like that compound effect. So I just wanted to make that point uh, right off the bat. It's a really important one. I'm glad you said that. So um, with my story, um, I grew up in a quote unquote normal household. So um, I say quote unquote because obviously there is no normal, but there were no uh, capital T traumas that happened. So I went through and... Uh, all the way up to my senior year of high school, uh, just assuming I was a moody punk rocker. Um, there were no, no major things that happened, but I would take things harder than most people. So things like break up or uh, just kind of the everyday struggles that teenagers would go through. I just took it a little harder than other people. Um, and again, I just thought it was just the way I was wired. So with the insight now, I believe there was some kind of chemical thing going on. And that's, that's what I can attribute that to. Now, the summer after high school, I call it the perfect storm. So my best friend was killed. Um, I, I was about to go to college, but all of my friends were also leaving for college. So my, my support system there dropped out. Um, my karate school had shut down, which sounds silly, but I had been in karate since I was 10 years old. And with that school shutting down, that was another really important support system closing down. Uh, and then there tends to be this pattern where um, late teens, early 20s, for a lot of people, like, again, I don't like to speak in absolutes, but for a lot of people, uh, quirks, let's say, tend to manifest there. So things like OCD, depression, anxiety, they tend to really manifest in those years. Um, so I got clobbered kind of with all four of those right there. I was 18 years old. It took me a couple of years to kind of get my footing. And I would say from about the age 20, I pretty much dedicated my life those first 10 years to uh, sharpening the sword, so to speak, figuring out my way to get out. And it took me a full 10 years. And then after those, the next 10 years, so I'm 40 now, the next 10 years, um, figuring out ways to share it. And I just recently wrote this book. It was, it was, um, you know, at the time we record this, we're just coming out of the pandemic and all the quarantines and everything. And that afforded me the time. I lost my job, which was a mixed, you know, mixed bag. So I said, you know what? Now I have the time to actually compile all these things that I had been, um, you know, I, I, was I was giving out emails to people and s speeches here and there. So I said, you know what? Now's the time. Because I had always joked I should just write a book. So I was like, you know what? Now I'm going to write the book. So that's where we are today. Oh, I'm so glad. And I'm looking forward to reading it. And it's kind of interesting. I, I think the pandemic, I, I've talked to many people who said, okay, this is my chance. And I wrote a book. And, you know, I think that there's a lot of good that can come out of, of this experience that we've had. And I also think that it's very timely 
because as we've experienced this global pandemic, for many people, it is helped be part of their perfect storm to create, you know, economic issues and social issues and that losing of support groups, not unlike you experienced. And so there are a lot of people who are struggling and who need some help and some really good advice. So you, um, I guess we're going to talk about lots of different things. I know you're a black belt in karate, so congratulations. That's super, super awesome. And um, so I know physical fitness is a, a part of the, the program. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and how that helps and what, what you've, I mean, I'm, I kind of know what you've done, at least some of it, but. Yeah, sure. So physical fitness at that point in my life, when at that, you know, that age of 18, when things really fell apart, it was just a byproduct of my martial arts. That was really my main sport. I had run some track, did, did a few things, but I wasn't a fitness guy, so to speak. So believe it or not, it came from the music scene. I was playing, I still play in bands, but I was playing in a band at the time where the guys were really into working out. And um, I, it, they piqued my interest. And um, I should put things in context here. So I'm five foot nine and 170 pounds, which is nothing to really remark on, right? And I work out six days a week because I'm a personal trainer and I, I teach group fitness. So I, uh, I just say that so uh, to set the stage where I'm not really, my body composition, that's really not a lot of fat, just, just for what it's worth, okay, just to set the stage. So 170 and there's not a lot of fat there, okay? Um, still a pretty thin guy. Back then, five foot nine still, <laughs> 124 pounds. So my depression <laughs> took a physical toll on me as well. I was almost 50 pounds lighter. Wow. Um, so I was getting sick a lot. And if I had gotten seriously sick, there was nowhere for me to go. Um, and that was a big wake up call. So when I started lifting these weights and started getting into fitness stuff, number one, I could see I had some kind of positive control. I didn't want to be that thin, but I was taking the, uh, the mainstream advice where, you know, the majority of Americans want to lose weight. And I figured I wanted to be healthy. So I was taking that advice. Um, it wasn't until I learned I was a different body type and this and that. I could see a physical difference in my body. And that was the very first spark that went off in my mind. I said, I can see, I can make a difference in this thing. Um, also, I was having fun learning all this stuff. I found a new passion. I, it, was, it was a great time. So um, that just kind of naturally led to the nutrition side. I'm a, I'm a fitness nutrition specialist, um, which I, I had recently gotten, but I, I was getting into nutrition at that time. And things just kind of built up from there. And what I found, like we said earlier, was every time I, I did something new that where I focused the arrow inward and not outward, um, I could feel myself. I, I talk about points in the book. I could feel myself going from a two to a three, from a three to a five. So, um, it, so when people ask me about... Um, you know, some of the things I did or what can they do, I tend to start with the physical. Now, like you said, not everybody's into that kind of stuff. And I do give a list of different activities people can do. It doesn't have to look like exercise, but it's something that you can see. It's a physical thing that you can see. And the, the feeling of accomplishment, when I started putting that muscle on my body, it made a world of difference. It really did. That is so incredible. And you brought up so many awesome things. I didn't want to interrupt, but it's like, oh, can I remember this all the way till the break? But you talked about one of the things you mentioned power, that you felt that you could see a change and there was some power. And some experts believe that depression is caused from a, a feeling of that we're powerless to handle our problems. And being able to recognize that there is some power we have some control over any aspect of our life is huge. Because as we, as we gather those, those successes and that, that regain our power back, then it makes all the difference in the world. So I'm thinking, spot on, spot on. I agree, I agree. And then the idea of using the physical fitness is also so brilliant. A lot of times people, the, the society, we, we think that lives are, in, and the aspects of our lives are kind of separate, like a little bento box where it's like, your physical fitness is here and your mental health is here and your social is here, but, but it's not, everything is interconnected. And so when we improve one, it improves the other and it works on such a natural thing. And also, cause you've done a lot of research, I'm sure you're aware of this, but, um, depression is chemical. It, it is caused by chemistry. 
But through our actions, we can change the chemistry in our body. And through MRI scans, we have proof that, that we can create measurable changes in the chemistry in our body through the things that we do, through the things that we think, through the things that we say. And it just, it's, it's empowering where we think, you know, I, for, for a long time, because when I was struggling, I felt so helpless. It's like I am just a plop on the floor. I, I can't do anything. I can't move. I can't whatever. And to, to gain that power back just little by little. And, and when you're out and you can see the whole picture, it's like, oh my gosh, this is mind blowing. We have the power to fix things. But when you're in it, it's like, I don't believe you. I don't believe you because I feel like I have no power. So I agree with everything that you said. And I love that there's more than one way to do it. So let's, let's talk about nutrition too, because that's also a huge sure. thing. So, Well, I, I just need to second everything you said. I love it. I'm speaking to a lady who gets it, and I love that. So. I do. Been there, <laughs> done that. <laughs> yeah, and, and something comes with that, right? A lot of the books I was reading on depression at the time, you know, I took, I, you have to take some of it with a grain of salt because um, I hadn't lived it. So, yeah, so I, I, I love that, that you said that. So to, to the nutrition stuff, uh, yes, completely agree. A lot of it is uh, chemical. Um, uh, along with that, there are some theories that um, it can be a digestion issue. Now, believe it or Big not, deal. believe it or not, and some of these people aren't going to believe me, they can look it up, uh, you actually create 90% of your serotonin in your gut. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I learned something. Yeah. Thank you. 90% of your serotonin is created in your gut and not in your brain. So a lot of doctors, believe it or not, are prescribing probiotics, trying to get gut health in order first before they do anything else. So I believe that that's part of it. I don't believe it's all of it, but I oh, do no. believe it's part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one thing that I, I beg my clients to do, I do uh, private one-on-ones, is um, I beg them to get um, an allergy test. I'm pointing to my back because it's it's not as bad as it seems. Yeah, they point, they put a bunch of little like pinpricks in your back and they map it out. So that way they can see like what you're specifically allergic to or intolerant of things like that. So uh, if you're not especially in tune with your body, like I know if I have a glass of milk, it's not going to end well, I stay away from milk. <laughs> um, but my, uh, my fiance, she wasn't sure what was causing. It. So it turns out she had a, a wheat allergy. So yeah. And, and that would affect her mood. Absolutely. So at the very least, you're going to um, feel a little better physically, right? But in turn, you know, it may get your gut uh, creating that serotonin a little easier as well. Like you said, it all goes together. It all goes together. Another one, um, and this is, this is a strange one, but because uh, depression is so hard to um, kind of map out in a clean box because it's, it's an internal, it's an experience thing, right? Right. People believe, some believe, Depression is actually a result of inflammation in the brain. Again, be. get your diet in order. You can get that inflammation down. Now, of course, I mean, I don't need to explain to people that processed sugars are bad, vegetables are good. But again, getting that allergy test, you know, you can pinpoint those foods that aren't going to sit well with you because it, it sounds like a lazy answer, but it's true. Everyone is different. When people ask me the perfect diet, I can't answer it because it's what's perfect for you. Actually, I think that that shows a higher level of understanding because when people do give the one size fits all, it's absolutely going to work for the people that that is the right answer for. Mm. And then it's not going to work for these other people. So it's interesting as you talk about you and your girlfriend, the, the milk and the wheat, those are, are very common allergies and sugar. You said, yeah, we don't have to tell you that sugar is bad and vegetables are good. We know that, but that doesn't mean that we do anything about it, you know, because sugar right. tastes yummy and sometimes vegetables are hard to prepare. So, And there's a place for sugar and there's absolutely a place for sugar. I'm not saying, you know, I don't do anything in absolutes. There's a place for it. Uh, but, you know, we, we, know, <laughs> we know our limits in our gut, right? Yeah, for sure. And supplements and stuff like that. What do you, what do you, have you found? Okay, so of course, please check in with your doctor, of course, uh, just because things could interact with other things you may be taking, uh, but otherwise, these are very safe. My number one favorite, if I could only take one thing, is turmeric. Turmeric, I'm in love with. Wonderful. Now, turmeric, I'm sorry? Tell me more. Okay, cool. So turmeric, it, it may also be called uh, curcumin, 
or curcuminoids. Now, it, it's kind of like a ginger root, but it's more orange. And you can get some of the benefits. The, the curcumin is actually um, the, the compound in turmeric. Turmeric's the root. The curcumin is what you want, right? That's, that's the compound we want. Um, but when you take a capsule, that's the equivalent of like eating like something like a thousand turmeric roots, okay? So, so the, the capsules do work better. Smart. However, right. <laughs> However, the important thing here is make sure you're taking it with a little bit of black pepper because that will increase the bioavailability of it. Otherwise, it's going to pass through your system and you're not going to absorb all those curcuminoids. Uh, about 50% of the turmeric you buy will have black pepper. The other 50%, no sweat, throw a little bit of black pepper on whatever you're eating for dinner and you, you'll be fine. Um, another one, I, I'm a big fan of flaxseed oil because I like to make a threes to get the inflammation down. Again, it all goes together. Inflammation may be playing a role. Let's go with that as well. Um, and another one, I live in the Northeast. I'm about three blocks from the beach in New Jersey. And we, um, we don't get a lot of sunlight in the winter. So a uh, a very big percentage of us actually are really low on vitamin D. So I also say, hey, uh, especially in the Northeast, you may want to be grabbing some vitamin D as well because there is some kind of correlation. I don't know if there's causation, but there is a correlation between low vitamin D and depression. Fantastic. Oh, those are wonderful. And I was expecting to hear a couple of other ones, like vitamin B is a huge one. Oh, that was, I, I didn't know if I was getting a little long. I've, no, like, no, oh, that yeah. one's huge because there are so many studies. And I like, I loved yeah. how you said not causation, but correlation, that um, it, a deficiency in vitamin B is highly linked to depression and anxiety. Absolutely. And so Absolutely. that one's a really, a really big and important one. So how beautiful that you're... Yeah, and if I could, I, I don't want to interrupt you, but no, uh, no. again, another important note, your vitamin B, please make sure it has B12 in it. A lot of them don't have the B12. And honestly, a lot of time you can tell by the price, you'll see a vitamin B complex and like another vitamin B complex, one will be a little bit more pricey. It's because the other one will have the vitamin B12. Now B12 only comes from um, animal sources. And a lot of people I know don't eat enough uh, or don't eat at all animal, animal products. So make sure that B12 is in there. Also, uh, it's water soluble. So even if you're low, it's okay. It's going to pass through your system. If you don't eat it, no harm, no foul. But I would argue that a lot of people are low in vitamin B as well. Definitely. That's fantastic. So when you get your, your turmeric, do you, you, do you just buy it online? And, and do you read the ingredients to find out if it has the pepper in it? I always read the ingredients. and I, I get it at um, just like a, a, any random convenience store, where whatever's on sale, as long as it has the black pepper in it, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. And check for black pepper for bioavailability. Hmm. Who'd have thought? You know, in my brain, I'm, I'm having this little mental picture of you holding your little capsule and sprinkling a little pepper on and popping it in. And pretty sure that's not the way it goes down, but it is kind of a funny picture. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? Tell me what else have you got what, in your in your book or your, your research? And we've talked about um, nutrition. We've talked about exercise. How about um, breathing or mindfulness or things like that? Oh, yeah, sure. So, um... The biggest pushback I get in my book is the one on um, meditation because I get a lot of people saying, oh, I can't meditate. They say, oh, I'm just not built for that. Uh, here's how it typically goes. People go to slow down. They're not used to slowing down. Their brain goes wild. They give up. They say, oh, it's not for me. I can't shut my brain off. Well, here's the thing. Nobody can shut their brain off. Here's how you start. I like to do uh, box breathing. I don't know if you've heard of box breathing. Teach me. Okay. So it's all through the nose, right? And when we breathe, we, we do it through the nose because there's a little cluster of nerves in the back of your nasal cavity. And when the air rushes over that, it activates your parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest and digest. Okay. On top of that, we're going to be doing all deep belly breathing, that diaphragmatic breath. So it's more horizontal. It's in and out as opposed to the up and down we tend to do nowadays. So think of a baby, right? It's that in and out, the big belly, right? Um, now, what we do is we breathe in through our nose for a count of four, hold it for a count of four, exhale for a count of four, hold it for a count of four. So it's like you're drawing a box, right? And sometimes I'll even visualize the numbers or I'll visualize myself drawing the box as I do the breathing. 
So right there, we're giving our minds something to do. We're, it's almost like a, a mindfulness exercise, which is, I call that like the stepping stone to a, a pure meditation, because meditation does take practice. Now, here's the big one. This is what people need to understand. Your mind will um, wander. Just take your thoughts, bring them back. It'll wander. Grab your thoughts, bring it back. Now that bringing the thoughts back, that's the practice. That's the meditation. That's where you're making your progress. So as long as you just keep bringing those thoughts back, bringing those thoughts back, it's not going to happen in a week. But if you do this for a month or two, you'll notice you bring them back a little less often, a little less often. You can hold that focus a little longer. So that's, that's my favorite place to start for sure is that box breathing. That's very wonderful. Thank you. And I also loved how you said it's not going to change in a week. So from my experience, and if yours, if you took 10 years, you know this as well, that healing is not like flipping on a light switch. It's not instant where it's just all of a sudden, woohoo, I'm all better because I breathed in a box or I took a tumor thing with pepper. It is more gradual, like a sunrise, where the change from moment to moment might be imperceptible, but it does come. And it is beautiful and it is powerful. So much so that when you're in that light, it's like I couldn't even remember what it was like to be in the dark. It's just that is a totally different person. And so I appreciate you mentioning that it doesn't take a week because I know we live in a society where if we're on the internet and that page doesn't pop up in two seconds, we go search for something else because... Who has more than two seconds to wait for what you want? But when it comes to healing our bodies and our minds and our spirits, it's it's a process. It's gradual and it takes time. So I hope that those who are listening don't get unrealistic expectations that if I, you know, do karate for a day, all of a sudden I'm going to feel better. You will feel better for a little while. And then, you know, you have to you have to keep going that step by step and little by little. So thank you. Excellent reminder. Okay. So breathing in a box, are there other practices that way? That's, I like that one quite a bit. (laughs) Great. Uh, I will, this does tie in um, as far as kind of sharpening the mind into, into maybe getting used to meditation. Um, And I get this a lot when I have people asking me for one piece of advice, if they love someone with depression, I say, um, ask them to, come with you to a yoga class. Say, hey, I'm feeling a little um, anxious about this yoga class. Would you mind coming with me? So what that's going to do for the person with depression is they're going to be like, oh, well, I'm doing this person a favor, right? So they'll feel a little good about that. They go to this yoga class. They're getting the physical aspect because they're learning all these moves. They're getting, um, well, the mental because they're learning. And they're getting some of that built-in um, meditation at the end when they, when they do their, those final poses. Also, we're getting that social aspect. So it's, it's a group fitness where you don't have a lot of you know, quote-unquote meatheads, right? <laughs> Typically, you're going to have a lot of friendly people, people in the yoga studio. So I, I'm a firm believer in asking someone to do something. See, in my book, it's a lot of doing. There are sections where it's mindset things, but it's a lot of actionable things people need to do. It, you have to put the work into it. This, this may segue to another part. You can... You can uh, kick me out if I'm going a little long, but um, I have a friend who had really bad anxiety. And um, we talk about anxiety and depression in the same breath a lot of the time because they tend to travel the same pathways in the brain. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. And I would, I've even shifted from one to the other semi-often, especially towards the end of my journey with uh, depression. So he had really bad anxiety, and I, um, I had convinced him to finally go to a therapist, and the therapist wanted him to start taking... Um, a medication and he was against it against it finally ended up taking it he called me he said you know i feel a little bit better but i'm still i'm still anxious and i said well you have to put in the work still it's not going to be that silver bullet you have to put in the work there has to be things you do a, a pill isn't going to solve everything for you it's part of <laughs> just like we said it's the theme for today's conversation it's part of your of your treatment if it, it, it you know so to speak um but it's not going to be everything Oh, man. Okay, so we've got a couple directions to go from that. And I, again, it's like, I get it. I, 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 
I agree with everything that you're saying, and I know that it's spot on. And so here we have not just one witness, but two people who are listening. This stuff works, guys. This works. So the idea of having things that are actionable, I am so on board with that because I believe, you know, education is wonderful. It is an important part of it. But without application, it doesn't do us any good at all. So those two things absolutely have to go together. And for me, I kind of liken my journey to healing as I was like I slid down this deep, dark, nasty hole with no light and no happiness and no sunlight, no windows, no doors. I thought, well, this is it. This is my life from now on. Here we are. There's no way out. And then when a friend and mentor showed me what to do, it was like she lowered a ladder down into my hole and showed me a way to climb out. But it was a ladder. It was not an elevator. It was not, oh, a quick push of the button and wahoo, I'm done. It took time. It took effort. And it was hard, but it worked. It worked. That was so huge. And so now also, as we talk about medication, what, tell me, tell me about medication. What, where, where's your take on that? So that was the last piece of my journey. Um, Although, you know, we never really finished working on ourselves. That was where I felt internally that I kind of uh, felt like I, that, chapter of my life was over with. I, I felt like I had kind of conquered it. And I hesitate saying that um, because you have to continue doing the work, right? Um, but um, I was, I had done everything else pretty well and pretty regularly. And it, it seemed like around eight o'clock at night, I would dip. Um, thoughts, thoughts would go dark, eight o'clock every night. So I told my primary care doctor this, and I believed all these different myths about medication. And she said, look, if you don't like it, just come off of it. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> I never thought you could just come off of it. Um, so what so, myth about medication were you following? Yeah, and I, I write about this in the book. See, I learned from friends who were teenagers who started taking this stuff, and a lot of it was just misinformation or the, the, the drugs they had at the time. I thought once you were on medication, you could never come off of it. You could only switch to different medications. Okay, so that's the myth. Is that It's forever. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. there were a few others, and I write about those. But um, so, so I started it, and and I should note what I'm on is an SNRI, and I'm on that. A very common one is an S- SSRI. I'm on an SNRI because I had like a um, like a neck injury with a nerve issue, and the SNRI helped um, with the pain issue. And it's actually common to give it to people with fibromyalgia. So, so it, that was the that was the thing that kind of convinced me to do it because so I was doing okay, uh, and when I started taking it. Man, it, it really uh, coalesced everything. It, it just felt like all this stuff that I've been pulling together um, got focused in my mind. And there were side effects. In fact, I have conversations with people a lot who uh, they say, oh, yeah, I took medication, uh, but I didn't like it. I didn't like the way it made me feel. And I'll say, well, how long did you take it? And they'll be like, three days. It's like, no, 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 no. Like a lot of things. It takes a while for your body to adjust. So three days in, I was... I had some insomnia. I had, um, um, uh, <laughs> this sounds strange. I had a weird feeling in my jaw, like I was about to yawn. And oh, that, that was the longest one I had. Yeah, it's a strange one, right? I, I, I don't know how to explain it. Um, so there were side effects. Um, but the first week was the hardest. The second week was the second hardest. And eventually, they all went away. It took a while, but all of those went away. Um, so if you're on the fence about medication, talk to your doctor, talk to your therapist if you're lucky enough to have one. Uh, and if you're concerned about the, the side effects, they may just go away. Never again, everyone's a little different, but they may go away. Just take some time and they're worth a shot. They're worth a shot. Absolutely. Oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because as we mentioned earlier, depression is chemical. And yes. part of dealing with those chemical changes, working with professional help, getting help from a doctor and using that medication for many people, it is exactly what they need. And some people resist taking medication because they don't want a label or they don't want a whatever. But sometimes that's the thing that you need because we're trying to get those, those chemicals, get our bodies in balance. And yeah. also there are things that we can do. So in addition to going to your doctor and getting that kind of help, working on yoga, working on breathing, working on all of those things can also help your your body and your mind make those adjustments so that at some point you can get off the medication and just be able to continue doing it in a, in a natural way. 
So um, it's that's wonderful to be able to to approach it from that angle. So thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah, yeah, and um, it's I, I'm really happy to be on your show talking about this because there tends to still be that stigma, and like you said, it's a chemical thing where we don't. There's no shame in taking drugs for diabetes, <laughs> right? Totally. Yeah. Your pancreas is, is just not, you know, working the, the way it, it could be working. So, okay. Um, there shouldn't be, your brain is also an organ. So, okay. I'm on medication and, and I try to be open about it as much as I can. There's no shame. And it's just that I don't, I, I um, don't create the same chemicals that other people do. But now I'm fine. So <laughs> there, there shouldn't be a shame in it, you know. I'm so glad you mentioned that because it is true. Whenever we have a physical ailment, there is no shame. But when there is a mental or emotional issue, a lot of people have the idea that it's just in your head. Just shake it off. Come on. And it's like, guys, our brains are actually a pretty important part of our body. And it is still part of our body, you know? So thank you for bringing that up. And thanks for visiting with me today. I have just been so excited to be able to hear, yeah, we have, we're on the same page. And that's a really good sign. Yeah, thank you again. Really, it really is an honor. I'm, I'm just so happy we're talking about this, and I hope some people can uh, can um, find some relief who are seeking it. Me too. That's the whole point. It's like, you know, I went through a crap journey, and it is what it is. But if that crap journey can help other people to be able to, you know, pull out of that darkness and find a ladder and get help, then you know what? It was worth it. It was worth it. So... If anyone's listening who's having a hard time, please, we invite you. Come. Come and be happy. It's a good thing. <laughs> All right. In closing, I'd like to share a quote from actor Christopher Reeve. He said, once you choose hope, anything is possible. Today, I invite you to choose hope. And if you're struggling with depression, I also invite you to take action toward healing. See you next time on Linda's Corner. <laughs>